Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this, the fourth of this year's uh, Dean's Lecture Series, and indeed the third biennial Fritz Duras Lecture. Tonight's lecture, as you know, is being presented by Professor Doon MacDonald. Uh, I need to acknowledge ACHPA, the Australian Council for Health, Physical Ed Education and Recreation, who sponsor this biennial Fritz Duras Lecture. This is a partnership that I value highly. I'm also pleased that seven members of the Duras family are here. Peter, Michael and Marianne, all uh, children of Fritz are here and some of the next generation as well. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land in which we hold this lecture. I pay respects to the elders both past and present of the Kulin Nation. Fritz Duras, uh, you can see many shots up there that give you a sense of history, but he was a renowned member of the Faculty of Education here at the University of Melbourne. His move from Germany to here in 1937 was facilitated by Professor G.S. Brown, who was then Dean of the Faculty of Education. Had a, he, the clear aim was to establish a course within the faculty to train teachers of physical education. Dr. Duras was a medical doctor specialising in sports medicine. He was appointed Director of Physical Education. He was also a pioneer in the field of physical education, this being the first course in physical education offered at any Australian university. In fact, it seems that his life was a series of firsts. He was the first Vice President of the Australian Sports Medicine Federation. He was the first President of the Australian Physical Education Association. He was the first Australian to be elected Fellow of the American Academy of Physical Education. He was the first President of the International Council for Physical Education and Sport. So it makes eminent sense then that we're gathered here this evening to celebrate this legacy with an address from Professor Doon MacDonald who will share with us the st story so far of the first Australian curriculum in health and physical education. And we've certainly no doubt come a long way since Dr Duras began at this university in 1937. So about Professor Doon MacDonald, she is Head of School and Professor of Health and Physical Education in the School of Human Movement Studies at the University of Queensland. She's also lead writer for the Australian curriculum, Health and Physical Education. Doon MacDonald completed her undergraduate degree in Human Movement Studies at the University of Queensland before teaching Health and Physical Education in primary and secondary schools. She obtained her PhD through Deakin University and then rejoined the School of Human Movement Studies at the University of Queensland in 1990. 1998, she won an Australian Award for University Teaching. Her research interests focus on understanding curriculum shifts in the field of health and physical education at the primary, secondary and tertiary level and their impact upon teachers, teaching and student engagement. You know the title of tonight's lecture. It's the new Australian health and physical education curriculum, a case of for graduate gradualism in curriculum reform. At the conclusion of Doon's presentation, there'll be a summing up and a perspective from the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority. I'm delighted that Robert Randall, who's the Acting Executive Director of ACARA, has come down uh, to be able to join us to do that. I've asked Rob also to move a vote of thanks. So Doon and Robert, I welcome to you both. And I thank each of you for making the effort to come down for this very important event. Uh, afterwards, I'll invite you out for a, uh, a glass of wine and a bit of a chat at the end if you like to do that. So could you please now welcome Professor Doon MacDonald to the lecture. <laughs> Well, good evening everyone, so distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to be here. I was just saying to the Jass family, I can remember in 1985 as an honours student going to Atchford conferences and being awestruck by the, the gravitas of the people who were presenting the Fritz Jurass lecture. And so it's such a pleasure um, many, many years later to be the, the person who's honoured to be chosen to do this. 
can I thank uh, the Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne, thank you Field and your colleagues. Thank you very much to Achpa Victoria and I would also like to thank Cara. Um, I'm not sure whether lead writers are meant to say that it's a fabulous organisation to have been <laughs> working with, but I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed the challenge that ACARA has, has uh, set me and, of course, the team who've been working with, work, working with me to produce the, the shape paper of, of health and physical education. <coughs> The exper oh, I'm going to come back to that steady gaze of, of Fritz Schrass. It might be a gaze that his children remember and, and uh, ask what he thinks about uh, how far we've come in, with Australian health and physical education. The, the journey to date, I, I think, has reminded me very much of a mirror ball. And the mirror ball, if you imagine that as a metaphor, Inside the mirror ball, I've been trying and my colleagues trying to pick which little glass tiles do we want to put on the outside of the mirror ball? Which content, which knowledge, skills, understandings do we want to have part of health and physical education? How many tiles do we want? And there are many people who want to see their tile, their glass tile sparkling on the mirror ball. And of course, the mirror ball also spins. And so as a mirror ball spins, you also have lights being shone out at it. And as you know, over the, uh, the last few months, there's been different lights have been shone on the mirror ball from different interest groups. And they want to see, quite rightly so, their interests being brought to life in the health and PE curriculum. So I'll come back to the mirror ball anal analogy and you might want to see as we go through the talk whether the things that you're particularly interested in might have the, uh, draw the attention that you'd like to see in the mirror ball. So to an overview of, of what I'd like to share with you over the next 40 minutes or so. To introduce you to you what we might understand by gradualism. Secondly, to look at the documents as we've got them so far, the curriculum as text in Health and PE, and then look at this question, is Health and PE a case of gradualism and is it, or is it a case for gradualism in curriculum reform? Now that photograph on the right hand side is kind of a strange one to have in there when you're talking about health and physical education. <coughs> but in 1927, a broad thinker, not unlike Fritz Gerass, a guy called uh, Tom Parnell at the School of Physics at UQ, set up an experiment because he said there can be surprises in the everyday. And it, it's pitch. It's in a funnel. And every nine years, there's a, the pitch drops. There's a drop comes out the bottom of the funnel. No one's ever seen it. But people know that there's change afoot. And interestingly enough, 2013, the year that the health and physical education curriculum should be completed with ACARA, the pitch will drop again. And so you see students watching it to see if they can see a difference. Um, and and they hope, I guess, that they'll see the pitch drop in, in 2013. But anyway, that's, that's, I guess, another metaphor for how we can think about gradualism. As its name would suggest, the gradualism Ha is not about a violent or significant reform that takes, uh, takes effect quickly. It's something, uh, from a philosophical point of view there, it's a gradually altering continuity. <laughs> or it can be seen, from a political point of view, as, uh, as not revolutionism. It's sort of a middle way of going about change. And it struck me as I talked to my colleague Richard Tinning, who, who I know was very honoured to do this lecture a few years ago, said, well, if you're going to work for a car and you're going to be writing this curriculum, you know what? We don't want to see gradualism. We want to see something more than that. So that's, that's in fact, where the challenges come from. Now, gradualism, of course, gets bad press from people apart from Richard Tinning. Curiously enough, on August the 28th, which is the date today, Martin Luther King 
1963 gave the I Have a Dream speech. And he was no admirer of gradualism. Although incrementalism is slightly different to gradualism, Paul Keating, when he was asked last year what his greatest fear for Australia was, he said incrementalism. So that didn't set up a case for gradualism very well. But if we look further, <coughs> an American philosopher in a recent text has said that he actually can see, I think, in the, in the move towards utopia, some redeeming qualities around gradualism. It can deceive and disarm an unsuspecting population as it moves towards, I guess, a democratic form of utopianism. So we'll come back to that as we go along. And you think, I guess, in your context, in your school or education systems, your organisations, would do you want to see Health and PE make a more violent, dramatic shift? Or are you comfortable with the concept of a gradual, gradual change? I now want to just unpack, go into this curriculum as text and what my journey was with my colleagues. Well, first of all, we needed to do a reconnaissance of what's happening um, nationally and, and in some ways what's on the mirror ball now. It is a really complex and rich field that those of us in health and PE are, very, are lucky enough to work in. There's some of the things, some of the content, knowledge, understanding and skills that we would want to perhaps see in a health and PE document. We then, of course, have the political overlay of different states and territories in Australia seeing our field quite differently. They call it different things and they draw different boundaries around that cluster of knowledge, understanding and skills. For example, Tasmania has only recently finished writing health and well-being as the name that represents its learning area. Um, you will see possibly the labels that you are most familiar with on that slide. Uh, but I understand, of course, Victoria is, is comfortable with the term health and physical education. But we need to recognise that not all states and territories in Australia are. But nevertheless, that was our mandate and uh, we've moved from that position. I also looked at not only, of course, the national documents, but international best practice in the reconnaissance phase of, of framing the shape paper. I want to just now focus on that outside circle because while we wanted to understand what's going on, we're also very keen to have a futures orientation. And this is, I'm almost stealing Rob Randall's idea here, that the students who graduate from schooling from this first document, it will be in 2026. So we're writing a document for the first graduate to be 2026. So, had the pleasure of spending some time reading futures literature. What will education look like? Well, schools will be in existence, people um, suggest. May not have those hard boundaries around it, the fences that keep people in and out the way they have in the past. It may not have classes necessarily in the boxes, in the classrooms, the way we currently have. But there will be schools, there will be guidance of learning. There should be, the futurists suggest, an orientation to lifelong learning. There should be, um, and we can expect because of access to knowledge, that there'll be many more partnerships and pathways than we might currently ex have now. And the teacher's role will possibly shift. There will be teachers, but they'll be brokering knowledge and guiding students into, into through perhaps more individual learning programs than we might currently have now. Health. Well, there is no doubt that the futurists see health needs to take a much stronger preventive focus. If we um, are to believe in Fraser, who works at the University of Queensland and the Diamantina Institute, who, as you know, is, is um, a, a very eminent scientist, um, he believes that that predictive medicine in the form of genetic profiling will be widely available in five years. Now imagine if you're teaching a class and they're sitting there with their genetic profile. 
you know, they're going to have particular interests possibly around how they should look after their body, what they should be eating. And the documents, although not futures literature, but documents such as the Healthy Future for All Australians produced by the Hospital Health and, um, Health and Hospitals Reform Commission also talk strongly about health literacy. And I felt we couldn't ignore this really important way of thinking about um, a, a part of the future of our field. Sport. So what might be happening in sport? Well, sport isn't going anywhere, particularly it's globalised entertainment, as we well know after perhaps most of us have spent quite some time watching the Olympics. Um, but again, an, Australian, an important Australian policy document says that the sporting dollar and resources needs to be split between participation and performance sport. And that's an important message, I think, for, for our uh, curriculum. And also to think about the change in sport and be ready for new sports and the rise and rise and rise of personalised and lifestyle sports. So while they would imagine that we've got some traditional sports still in very strong place in Australian society, they're going to be increasingly new and varied sports, whether urban sports, extreme sports, become engaging for young people. And we need to think about how we cope with that in a curriculum. So we've got the futures orientation, and I, I haven't got time to explore then the ACARA's framework in which Health and Peace sits, which are general capabilities and cross-curriculum priorities, which again gives some wonderful direction on the richness of the curriculum. I want to explore five propositions that were, that were centred to the thinking in the SHAPE paper and are currently informing the next phase. The first one is educative. We've suggested that health and PE as a learning area in schools is about education. Now, this can sound a little blunt, but we are not a weight loss clinic. We are not the Australian Institute of Sport. We are about education in schooling and we are an important one of the key learning areas outlined in the Melbourne Declaration. You know, and what a fabulous space to be in. So let's remember that. So we really want to pri prize and prioritise learning. And we'd love a learning that is about uh, knowledge and skills that can be transferred across contexts and across life. So learning for life. Um, so while we can't explore all movement contexts, we can have a range of skills and competence that are going to be helpful as a student moves across contexts or across health issues. So very important, educative. And gosh, where would I go? You know, there's been so much in the media, as you know, about uh, people wanting to see other things in schools recently and particularly... Um, other things in health and physical education. But that's a story for another day, I think. Secondly, we want the curriculum to take a strengths-based approach. Now, if you look at that diagram, that it shows sort of a river of life. And a strength-based approach suggests that we should shift the focus somewhat from prioritising not only our resources, but our learning around disease, but extend it to make sure we have a plenty of learning around health ease and the resources that young people need now and in the future to, to be and maintain health. The person who uh, model, the salogenic model, um, has been uh, created by is Aaron Antonovsky. Now here I just want to change tack a moment and just say it's fascinating reading Aaron Antonovsky's biography in relation to Fritz Gerasses. The Jewish heritage was very much a part of the moving across continents. Aaron Antonovsky was actually born in the United States but moved to Israel where he was feeling, going to feel more comfortable. 
He actually started out as a philosopher and moved to health. And we know Fritz Strauss started out in health and sort of moved to philosophy and education, almost a, a reverse there. And um, he said there was something that some people had a coping mechanism and could problem solve health throughout their lives. And he wanted all people to be able to do that. So his life work was to talk about unraveling this mystery of health. And so that's just a little bit more about it. When it gets translated, and, and the, um, really the European countries have been the strongest in translating Antonovsky's work into health systems, very much about what are your assets and let's build on them. And uh, one of my PhD students who worked in Indigenous education found it a terrific way of thinking about Indigenous health, for example. What are your assets? Let's build on them. And of course, it's also very much about context. Thirdly, movement. A third proposition, extremely important for our field, Movement is central to what we're on about. It's not only learning in movement, it's learning about movement and it's learning through movement. It's central to both the content of what is in health and PE and the mediums for learning in health and PE. We're envisaging movement competence and not a competence across something or not experience across too many fields that ends up the students not feeling competent. We're suggesting that the next phase of the curriculum could be structured so students have the opportunity to develop skills and they feel competent movers in something. And then they can take that love of movement and that competence and sense of competence across into other movement experiences. I mentioned health literacy in part as the futures literature and so it has a strong place in the documents to date. And health literacy can be seen about that navigating the health system and navigating personal health. We've found Nutbeam's work, Australian, very useful for thinking about dimensions of health literacy. Functional, which it's at most basic, understanding what is the problem that I'm faced with here, I've got, my family's got, my friends have got. Interactive, which is the, the resources to then make a change to the personal health, make a change to something related to health, maybe in the school. And thirdly, critical, which takes the students through to more of an advocacy dimension. Um, my colleagues and I have recently done a unit in a low socioeconomic area outside Brisbane using a salogenic approach to health literacy. And the stories of some of these... Um, low literate uh, 13, 14 year old boys who found ways to help them and their friends and their dad eat better, they're just terrific. So in some ways we've, we've started testing the ground and, and we think it's going to be fruitful. Health literacy, of course, is um, all about education as well, so it fits very nicely uh, um, with that first premise about we're on about education outcomes here. It's strong on context as with salutogenesis and of course um, things like the socio-ecological model of learning can be a very useful framework for, for probably the teachers in the more senior years to unpack what are the resources in the, in the context that the students are in and hopefully it goes, gives students some power to change things in their lives and the lives of others. And the last proposition of the five. We've suggested that within the experience should be included a critical inquiry approach. And this talks to both the content and pedagogy. This is where Rob should block his ears because our remit was not to mention anything much about pedagogy. Um, but the social inquiry approach is, is speaking back to the issues of so many young people becoming alienated from movement and from their bodies and from making healthy decisions. So the critical inquiry approach within the curriculum is hopefully about getting them to not only ask questions, inquiry questions, questions about is the media reporting on sport fairly, uh, questions of should we do 
uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity in short bursts or should we have longer periods of moderate and low levels of physical activity? That's a question no one knows the answer to. We want students to be able to read the literature and make decisions, read the literature about substances, read the literature about nutrition. So, uh, but asking questions all the time because, of course, that knowledge changes. And, of course, the flip side to a, a, a critical inquiry approach is also understanding that uh, not everybody has the opportunity to be sort of healthy, wealthy and wise. And there's that, um, there's very much a concern about equality and equal outcomes and, and everybody having opportunities to enjoy good health and a physically active life. And again, this is where Rob needs to block his ears. We also put in there, we snuck it in, and it actually had resonance quite widely that this needs to occur in a healthy school environment. Of course, it's beyond the ACARA to insist that all schools have a healthy school environment. But we felt it's worthwhile reminding people that if we really want to achieve optimal outcomes from what is being learnt and taught in classrooms, we needed to sit comfortably in a really supportive, consistent message. So they were the five propositions. It's interesting that some, in fact most of them, had quite strong resonance with particularly teachers and school systems across Australia. And on another occasion, I, um, and another time and place, I think we can look at what it is about the tacit knowledge of the education community that resonated with, that found resonance with, with these propositions. So, let's go back to that gradualism question. I would like... I would hope that intellectually what we have developed so far is actually going to at least nudge change. I think it's speaking back to challenges of lifelong learning, of health and PE being educative and perhaps avoiding being the recipient of many requests that it can't fulfil in terms of health. I would like to think that if we have highly health literate young people, we are contributing to health inequalities and, and that is sort of a, a wicked problem of our time. And that we are also on about having young people who are really keen to engage in a movement culture across the lifespan because we know that that's not always happening either. So I guess I put it back to you. Is this gradualism? I'm just going to hold my thought on, on that because there are a couple more slides that I want to show you that were in the shape paper that surprisingly attracted more attention you might have thought. But then again, maybe I'm speaking as someone who's been in a university too long and not a school. And these are about curriculum structures. So what do I mean by that? Well, just two throwaway slides you might think, but it wasn't the case. There are two strands. Now, that for many of us might not seem all that problematic or even possibly surprising. But that drew a lot of interest from groups who couldn't necessarily see themselves as strongly in those two strands. So there was strong representation, rightly so, from groups such as outdoor education and home economics. There were states and territories who looked at those bands and said, ah, but our year seven isn't in the secondary school. How can we split a band? <coughs> there were people who looked at the notional time being given for writers as a guidance for what may be the time that health and PE can occupy in schools. And it comes out at two hours a week. And teachers said and principals, we can't do two hours of this a week because we've got all this other stuff we have to do. So in fact, what the, the intellectual work that we'd done around some of the propositions was perhaps not as contentious or indeed revolutionary as some of the more structural issues that were part of the story we told in the shape paper. 
So I'd have to say, having spent more and more time with teachers now face to face discussing this, for some this was no case of gradualism, it actually is a case more of, of revolution. Um, they saw quite significant structural changes um, being suggested in the document for how they understood the field playing out for their interest area, their school, their, um, their product, their whatever. Um, they thought that the learning entitlement of two hours per week was going to be really challenging to school timetabling. They thought that it's going to um, put pressure on resource allocations in ways that hadn't occurred before. The primary school specialists thought it was a uh, really it was a, um, a challenge to their identity. They said we're not we're not and haven't been in many states, health and PE teachers, we're PE teachers. And how are we going to teach one lesson a week if we've got to teach across the two strands and we'll be given one strand and where are we going to find time to collaborate? And so the structures for them raised a whole lot of really interesting questions, um, as well as the knowledge, understanding and skills. And in Queensland last week when I was speaking to a group of, of um, health and physical educators, the primary school specialist said, well, where do we start with this? And my suggestion was, call yourself health and PE teachers as your first step, not PE teachers. Um, but of course, that also raises uh, issues around the, the new knowledge, skills, and understandings that all teachers will need in order to teach this document. And the sense is that there will be a need, and this is where ACHPA is so important, for sig some significant um, professional development in order for teachers to feel, feel comfortable with some of the ideas in, that, that may eventuate in the next phase. So I guess the question is, so do I believe this is a case of gradualism? It took me a while to come to my own answer. When I wrote the abstract, I actually didn't know what I thought I'd be saying as the answer. Um, and I think, yes, it is. It's a case of, of gradualism. I think it's, um, if we look at some of those definitions, it is kind of a steady, um, persistent, and maybe disarming, subtly, of, of what we know of health and PEs to date and where we can possibly um, reform to make it more engaging for all young people. So I want to um, make a case for why gradualism is not such a bad thing. And quite bizarrely and by accident, um, I went to one of my favourite writers, Donald Sean, who you might be surprised to know has also got a strong Jewish heritage. He also went to Yale, as did Aaron Antonovsky, and he also shifted fields like uh, both Fitzgerald and Aaron Antonovsky. And he started out um, in philosophy and then moved to really mu very much organisational change, but also worked in areas of architecture and so Again, another man who made a wonderful contribution by crossing borders and boundaries of the disciplines. So Donald Sean actually says, well, yes, this is the most change in Western democratic societies are a case of gradualism. Um, because the stable state is so strong. So if we apply that to education, the education system is so, so strong, such a large ship moving in a direction, that to claim anything other than gradualism um, would perhaps be a, a gross overstatement. If we then look at gradualism in the context of curriculum reform, I want to quote Karen Seashaw Lewis there, just in case you think I only read books or things written by men. Um, that she wrote, did some wonderful work on what is going to be effective, sustainable curriculum reform. And I think that that uh, first quote is so important. Attempts to change schools that do not take the characteristics of teachers and schools into account cannot succeed. And I think that's what we have done all along the road. And I think that's what ACARA has done meticulously in working with teachers and organisations in their consultation phases, and there are still more consultation phases to come, to make sure that there is a connection with the people who are going to be responsible for implementing the curriculum. 
Lewis and other writers remind us that we will not have curriculum change without that recognising what are existing teachers' beliefs and interests and practices. So the primary PE teachers in Queensland who said, we haven't been thinking of ourselves as health and PE specialists for many years and there's a whole lot of industrial issues around that because they have the students while the teachers have their teaching free time, etc. So, so we need to remember that and make sure that there is support for them making that shift. We need the input, as I've suggested, and that has been, I think, a, a strong um, uh, attribute of the, the story to date. And we've got to have documents that are accessible to teachers and inspire reform. So I would like to think that the te that teachers and, and administrators, principals, will see a connection that can inspire reform. So overall, though, is the health and physical education curriculum a case of gradualism in curriculum reform? Well, I would suggest that as with beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. And that is the perspectives were varying and have varied across providers, uh, people with a particular commitment to particular subject matter knowledge, some of those tiles on the mirror ball. Leaders, as if schools, are seeing it very differently to how teachers are. Generalists are seeing it very different to how specialist teachers are. And academics, you can't pick them. They've come from all directions. <laughs> um, so, I, I want to now close by returning to that first slide with Fritz Strass looking at, at the work that we've done to date. I won't try and suggest whether he thinks it's a case of gradualism or not, but I was thinking, what would he think of some of the directions that the health and peer curriculum may take or be taking? So I think that we have got in this document primarily a commitment to education and health. And I think, and you can, this row of distinguished guests here can sort of give me the thumbs up or thumbs down, as the, that, that Fritz Duras would have liked to have seen that, given his, his own biography across health and, and, and education. There's no doubt, I've just heard how many 13,000 books he had in his own personal library. He was a lifelong learner and he was an interdisciplinary learner and I think the future of this curriculum document is very much in that lifelong learning and taking what has been health education, physical education, home economics, outdoor education, traffic safety and mixing it all in in new and creative ways, um, breaking down some of those boundaries. He was certainly uh, uh, committed to being engaged in movement and learning and out, about movement. And you only needed to look at his University of Melbourne program to see the wonderful breadth of learning that his first range of, of graduate teachers needed to study in order to become competent in teaching the field. Um, and at a personal level, he had that commitment. And certainly in the document, that the strong flavour, um, we, we believe in both learning in and about movement. And finally, it's, we hope to have a generation of young people who are committed to action, who are committed to advocacy and may be also leaders in building community assets. And when you look through that list of firsts, as Field said, that Fritz Strauss was associated with, the, those community assets are exactly the sorts of assets we want young people to be able to navigate across their lives whenever they need to and hopefully contribute and build to those assets. I'll leave it to you to decide whether, for your perspective, this is a case of gradualism, but I, I hope that in your areas it does inspire reform and it does, I hope, take us in the, some of the directions that Fritz Duras laid such a strong foundation for. Thank you.
afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I've been invited to come down and, uh, if you like, reflect upon uh, Dune's presentation. And I guess with all those invitations, it's a matter of getting the, uh, the, the focus and the judgment right. Um, there are some things I'd like to say uh, as I go through this, um, through this presentation and I've added to my notes as I was listening to Dune. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge there's been certainly a lot of discussion over the last few years about national curriculum or the Australian curriculum and it's been largely centred around what English, what maths, what science, what history. It, it is the case, and Dune's made that point tonight, over the last couple of years we have now moved from those and we're into what we called phase two, phase three curriculum. And so we're now having discussions about, and I will list them, geography, languages, the arts, technology, civics and citizenship, economics and business and health and physical education as we've heard about tonight. So if anyone thought there was a bit of debate about the f first four areas, in that, in that group of subjects there's a lot of debate to be had. Um, it's not fair to say, and I was, I've got to refine even some of my language, that in this area of health and physical education my prior experience in a, in a state education department or in a couple in two states has been this is where we deal, deal with sex and drugs and all those other things. Dune's quite rightly reminded me, and as she said here tonight, is no, not necessarily. We don't, you know, it's a matter of how do we position this area so this is not the grab bag or the solution um, finding area for the whole curriculum. And, and Dune's reinforced the importance of this area in, in focusing on the roundness and completeness of young people. So I thought, um, with, and I guess what I want to acknowledge, with each of the areas that ACARA has um, initiated and, and all of the areas of the curriculum are now underway. Some are either being taught, uh, the last one, economics and business, is now being shaped. Um, in all of those areas, uh, the approach that we've taken, initiated by our chair, Professor Barry McGaw, is to go, rather than just get a little committee of people together who know the area well, is to go to an academic in the field and say, let's get someone who is uh, focusing on the area, focusing on what we want young people to learn and get them to lead the work and that notion of a lead writer and, and the shaping phase. And certainly as we've heard here tonight, um, Doon, we approached Doon a while ago and sort of made her the offer um, to take this up and I am pleased to hear. I don't think she, hopefully she said it not just because I was in the room, but, uh, but, but certainly uh, I want to acknowledge the role that Doon's played. Doon has led the work in this area. Um, as many of you will know, that comes with lots of opportunity, but it also comes with challenges. And I just want to acknowledge the role that Doon has played in it. The insights that she shared with us tonight reinforce that. Um, we have actually started writing the curriculum. As Doon said, we're we are um, tracking towards a completion of the health and physical education curriculum by the end of 2013. Uh, we will take all of those other curriculum, we'll have the whole lot, the job lot done in terms of foundation or prep to year 10 curriculum by the end of 2013. And it's an interesting point. Now, I just want to just add a couple of comments here and pick up on the theme of gradualism. Uh, Dr Peter Hill, who was our chief executive officer with ACARA, was the, the first chief executive officer with, it, with us, um, when he, I think he'd been back in the country a couple of weeks as he took up the role, he said the challenge... Uh, for us as a country, uh, and again we could get into deep discussion about the why we're doing an Australian curriculum, but he said the challenge for the country is to get us all on the same page, to actually get on the same page and talk about what it is we want for young people. I have talked about my two young children who are still going through school, uh, and again we can always, and as Dune said, said, let's talk about what it is we want for young people, not what we've done in our own professional lives, but what is it we want for young people. And if you, if you stop, whether it's futures, uh, um, text or others, if we stop and imagine what it's going to be like, there, there is a challenge for us. But the first challenge was as a nation to all get on the same page. Dune has had a key role in doing that. Uh, in relation to the curriculum. And again, that first page being achieved, and I, that's almost an understatement, but getting that curriculum out next year for the whole uh, nation to work with is a significant step. Um, we are close to doing that. Um, what I want to do is then just equally say, though, because from ACARA's point of view, it's only 18 months away and we will have achieved that. We will have the whole F to 10 curriculum. But equally noting where I am and the nature of this audience, to sort of say, in some ways, having got on the first page, it's then a matter of turning that page and looking and starting to wonder about the next few chapters. Uh, what does it mean for us, for young people? And again, one of the things I'd want to do, in, given this opportunity tonight, is just briefly you know, wonder about some of those things. 
Dune's point was up there about we can get the curriculum document. That's just one part of the whole equation. You know, what is it? What are we doing to support teachers to focus on the quality um, on, of the quality they're teaching and attending to student learning? How, how do we? What do we now know as a nation to to work? Not in eight states and territories, not you know with with dots on the line which reflect our sort of federated history. But what do we now know, and what are we preparing ourselves to support teachers wherever they are around the country to do better uh, for young people? So there's an opportunity. There's part of the next chapter that we need to pursue. I think I would want to declare, even as and and Doon talked about structure. Even as we settle, the ink starts to dry. Actually, it's not drying because it's all digital. But as soon as we get it up there in the website, the sequences that we've got through content descriptions and achievement standards, we need to start engaging with now how do we continue to prove those? There's a whole lot I think we know more than we did, you know, and there's a lot more for us to learn about how do we continue to refine those? One of the downsides of our curriculum model is some of those organisations of K to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because it's a good organising thing, but it also can be a limitation. How do we continue to prove and refine those sequences so that actually become tools for identifying what young people know and helping to plan them to move forward without, if you like, some vertical barriers and limitations? So how do we do that? Uh, you know, we, we can have discussion about the knowledge that's going into this, the professional knowledge, but what do we actually do? What do we know about young people's learning in this space, let alone other spaces? John Hattie asked me as I came in, was Akara going to move to, I don't know whether he was tongue in cheek or joking or not, but are we going to move to do assessment in this area uh, and, and stuff like that? Now, to the extent that that assessment contributes to improving what we know and improving student uh, learning, um, may, you know, we should have that discussion. So, but what is it, as we get the curriculum out there, that just says we're going to continue to have a look at it and improve it and refine it? I think the other thing that I would want to say, and, and Doon touched on them, and I won't open up the full discussion, but I think we also need to continue to focus on the discipline-based uh, approach that ACARA has pursued. Unashamedly, we said we're going to organise the curriculum with a focus on disciplines, but not disciplines alone. We're going to look at it from a, we can present the curriculum so you can look at it from a discipline point of view, but also that you can look at it from a general capabilities point of view and the three cross curriculum priorities. Now, I think there's again a discussion for us to continue to have about you know, the opportunities that those things can reveal. So, in listening to Dune tonight, I want, again, I want to acknowledge one where we are, the role that Dune has played in that, uh, but I also want to acknowledge in her presentation tonight. Um, there's some, a lot of challenges and I think some of those she will work through, she'll continue to lead our work and contribute to it in the drafting of the curriculum, but there's a number there that we're going to have to, as a broad education community, continue to work with as the curriculum is being implemented. So I very much appreciated listening to Doon tonight. It is always interesting to get yourself out of your office. For me it was hop on a plane and come down, but out of your normal thing uh, to catch up with people in different contexts, but to, deli to listen to someone who you've been working with, but from a different perspective. So I very much appreciate that opportunity. Um, I would like, if I can, just take a moment, Field, to thank the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, um, True Field and others for putting this on and, and inviting me to come along. I would like to acknowledge the Juras family, and uh, I've learnt a little bit more about um, your family here tonight. But most of all, I guess on my behalf, on, on, you know, from my point of view, and also on behalf of everybody here, I would like to thank uh, Doon. Um, again, it's, it's one thing to actually get in and do the work, but the challenge of reflection as you come along and talk to um, people about what you've been doing is, is, is an opportunity, but also a challenge. So Doon, thank you very much for the, your presentation here tonight. And, and I'm going to be so bold uh, on behalf of uh, the Melbourne... Um, the University of Melbourne, here's a little gift uh, for your presentation tonight. And on behalf of everybody here, thank you very much. It's been fantastic. <laughs>